Thin Mints, Samoas, Tagalongs. Yes, these are all very delicious Girl Scout cookies. But for me, they were also a source of inspiration. As I watched my then eight-year-old daughter put on her vest and walk down to the end of our driveway and attempt to sell Girl Scout cookies with far more enthusiasm than an idea about how to actually market and sell a product. It was that experience, combined with having to read yet another rainbow fairy story, that gave me my inspiration to write a book series to help empower girls with an entrepreneurial mindset. Now, inspiration's a funny thing. You can't just rub a lamp and expect it to magically appear. And even if you could magically conjure up some inspiration, you still need to be able to turn that inspiration into a product or a movement or a book series. My path from inspiration to publication was filled with rejections and objections and naysayers and failures, and yours will be too. But it's how you deal with those outside forces that'll make the difference in whether you can turn your inspiration into something that just might change people's lives. Now, as a kid, I was always working. Uh, in elementary school, I actually bought 95 pounds of gummy bears and hired my friends to sell them. I worked at a baseball card shop. I got paid in cards. I babysat. Uh, I sold nuts and dried fruit and more gummy bears at a food store. And then in high school, I got a job working at a local ski shop. It allowed me to ski anywhere I wanted for free. That was a nice perk. Then as an adult, uh, I worked with entrepreneurs to help them scale and build their businesses. So I was part of a three-person team that bought IMAX, the giant screen movie theater company, in the early 1990s. At the time, there were about 75 IMAX theaters in the world, mostly in museums and science centers, and most of them were showing educational films. But the guys I worked for saw people walk out of those theaters and say, wow, that was an incredible experience. So their inspiration was to transfer that wow experience from a fish film in a museum to Spider-Man at your local multiplex. That was their inspiration, and that's the reality of the company today. I moved from uh, New York to Silicon Valley about 10 years ago to be the chief operating officer of Coupons.com. The founder of Coupons.com had his inspiration when he was visiting his in-laws for a weekend. He came downstairs on a Sunday morning, and he saw his father-in-law sitting at the kitchen table in his bathrobe with a shoebox, scissors, and a Sunday newspaper and he proceeded to pull out the scissor and clip out all the coupons from the Sunday newspaper. And so he thought, well, there's got to be a better way. And so he created Coupons.com. So after I left Coupons.com, I was talking to a lot of other entrepreneurs trying to find another company to help build and scale, and that's when I was struck with my own inspiration in the strangest of places. So let's go back to my eight-year-old daughter. So she's selling Girl Scout cookies for the first time. She's so excited. She puts on that vest, and she takes her step stool down to the end of the driveway, and she sets up her cookies, but then she just stood there. She didn't know what to do. She's just standing there. People are walking by, and she's just standing there. And my wife was the one that said to her, hey, you know, when people walk by, you should say good morning to get their attention, and make sure you look people in the eye when you talk to them. And a couple of weeks later, my daughter was doing a charity bake sale with a friend of hers, and she said, tell people all the money goes to charity, because even if they don't want to buy a brownie, maybe they'll still give you a few bucks. Frankly, I was more entertained by the whole thing than anything else. I was like, oh, that's so cute. She doesn't know what to do. But then fast forward to a Sunday morning. This is now June of 2014. I'm laying in bed reading books with my girls. My older daughter was on my right side, and she was reading from the Who Was series. These biographies for kids, they're great. So she's reading Who Was Queen Elizabeth. My younger daughter was on my other side, and she was in kindergarten, so I was reading to her, and as fate would have it, the book she selected that day was like the 57th book of the Rainbow Fairy series. I just wanted to throw the thing out the window. Now, for those of you that are not completely familiar with the Rainbow Fairies, with the 57th book of the Rainbow Fairy series, it's not that much different from the 56th book, or the 35th book, or the 17th book. They're all pretty much the same. My daughter loved these books, but as an adult, they're painful to read. Now look, I gave the Rainbow Fairies a ton of credit. It helps her imagination. It makes her want to learn how to read. But my older daughter was getting the exact same benefit, and she was learning about Queen Elizabeth. 
And so for some reason, the rainbow fairies and the thin mints combined in my brain, and I had my inspiration to create a franchise to help empower girls with an entrepreneurial mindset. Now, why girls? Well, two reasons. First of all, I did it for my daughters. This is something I wanted them to have, and it didn't exist, so I had to create it myself. The other reason is because of all the inequalities in the workplace today. More Fortune 500 CEOs today are named James than are women. Now, I wasn't trying, I'm not trying to create the next generation of female CEO, although, don't get me wrong, that would be great if we could. The idea here is to empower girls with an entrepreneurial mindset. Think like entrepreneurs. My idea is that girls that have an entrepreneurial mindset, who are comfortable saying yes when everyone else is saying no, who have grit and a growth mindset and are comfortable with risk and know how to sell something, be it like a physical product or one of their ideas, and most importantly, who are comfortable, who understand that failure isn't what happens when you don't succeed, failure is what happens if you don't try in the first place. My belief is girls with that entrepreneurial mindset are going to be far more successful in life regardless of the path they choose. So that was my inspiration. And when I thought of it, it came to me as a franchise. It came to me as books and games and apps and in-school programs and after-school programs, all to get girls to open up their first lemonade stand or bake sale and start that entrepreneurial journey. But when I thought about it, I thought the best way to launch would be through a series of books for girls. Now, I'm not a writer. I'm a business guy, and I didn't think I'd be the person to write the books at the end of the day, but I knew I had to get it down on paper to explain to someone what it was. So I spent the next three years creating that first manuscript and learning how to write. It were the three hardest and most humbling years of my entire career, uh, and it made, me, uh, it made me do two big things. The first was I had to put aside any pride I had and I'll give you three examples. One of the first things I did when I had this idea was I went out and I bought writing children's books for dummies. Now, it's a great book. It taught me a ton about the publishing industry. But symbolically, also, it was so appropriate because I was a dummy. I had to get my mind into that framework of I knew nothing, I was starting from scratch. The second example of putting aside my pride was uh, I had to take advice wherever I can get it. So I gave my manuscript to a bunch of 11-year-old girls to read as beta readers, just to get their feedback. One 11-year-old girl pointed out a grammatical error that I made 127 times in that first manuscript. You see, it turns out that when you write a line of dialogue, you, you have to include that little comma before you close the quotation marks. Now, I know most of you are sitting there going, well, yeah, you need a comma. I didn't know that. How, how was I supposed to know that? I'm writing business plans and memos. How do I know where the comma goes? But this 11-year-old girl was like, yo, dude, you need a comma. So I had to take advice wherever I could get it, and I'm very thankful to her and all the other people that gave me, uh, gave me feedback along that journey. The last example of putting aside my pride was one of the things they teach you is if you're going to write in a genre, you have to read in a genre. So for the last five years, I've read almost nothing but books written for third to sixth grade girls. You would not believe the looks I get on an airplane when I pull out a copy of the Cupcake Diaries and a highlighter. <laughs> so the other big thing I had to do was get comfortable with failure and rejection. And I'll tell you two stories. First person I ever met in the publishing industry was a friend of a friend. She was a literary agent at a high-powered agency in New York City. So I went to meet with her, and she was great. I knew nothing. I had just been getting started, and she told me a t taught me a lot about the, the publishing industry. And we talked a little bit about my idea, and she said to me, if you were my friend, I'd tell you not to waste your time. And so I, I vividly remember, I left her office, and I took the elevator downstairs, and I'm standing in the lobby of this building on Fifth Avenue in New York City, and I called my wife. And she says, how did it go? And I said, it was awesome. She told me that if I was her friend, she'd tell me not to waste my time. And there was silence on the other end of the phone for a little while until finally my wife said, so what was so awesome? 
And I said, you know, I had heard to get a book published, you're going to get 100 rejections. 100 people are going to tell you no before you get that one yes. I had just got my first rejection. And I, I was fine. I wasn't bleeding. I wasn't physically injured. I wasn't mentally scarred. I knew that I could then deal with not only that rejection, but all the other rejections that would follow. So a couple of months later, I went to a writer's conference. And one of the things you could do at these writer's conferences is you could submit the first 10 pages of your manuscript to an editor at a publishing house, and they'll give you a critique. So I submitted my first 10 pages. I go to the writer's conference, and uh, I'm walking to this meeting to meet with this editor, and I know she's going to sign me on the spot. She's going to say, oh my god, this is, this is so great. Thank you for submitting it. Please let me publish your book. I mean, I know it. I walk into this meeting, and she was brutal, brutal. She hands me back the manuscript, and uh, uh, in the margin, she had written some comments. So next to one scene, she had written, all I have to say to that is, duh. Then there's another scene where I've got two girls talking to each other, and to, to, uh, uh, to express her opinion about how, how unrealistic the dialogue was, she had written, I was surprised to learn you have girls yourself. She was brutal. But she was absolutely right. Those, it was awful. Those 10 pages were terrible. But what she had done is she was literally and figuratively telling me, you cannot do this. And so it created a decision tree for me, probably the biggest one I had in this whole journey, which was I had to decide if this was something I wanted to do. And for a number of reasons, not the least of which someone had just told me, you can't do this, I decided that I was going to move forward. But I knew that it was going to take a lot more work than I had thought. So I went to more writers' conferences. I read more books about writing. I uh, took writing classes. I hired freelance children's book editors to work with me. And just over two years after I got that critique, I signed a three-book deal with Macmillan. We brought in a fantastic co-writer to help create a, a series with far broader appeal than I ever could have done myself. And our first book comes out on May 7th. This is a picture of me seeing my book for the first time, about four and a half years after I got the inspiration. I don't think I could make that face again if I tried. And in the back of that book, in the acknowledgments section, there is a very heartfelt thank you to that editor and that agent. Because if it wasn't for the kick in the pants they gave me, at the exact moment they gave it to me, I could not have completed that manuscript and I wouldn't be here today. So the idea of this isn't that you should walk out of here and suddenly start hunting for your inspiration. Inspiration doesn't work like that. It hits different people at different times. So this is Reed Hastings. When Reed was 37 years old, Legend has it that he returned a copy of Apollo 13 to his local Blockbuster video store and got charged a $40 late fee. He thought, there's got to be a better way. So he invented Netflix. This is Alina Morse. When Alina was, when Alina was seven, she went to the bank with her dad, and the teller offered her a lollipop. And her dad said, well, you know, Alina, lollipops aren't very good for your teeth. And she said, well, why can't there be a lollipop that's good for your teeth? So she did a little bit of research, found out there's something out there called xylitol, which helps to promote the growth of your tooth enamel, figured out how to put it into lollipops, and created zollipops. Alina Morse, at age 13, was just the youngest person ever to be on the cover of Entrepreneur magazine. And you can now buy zollipops in Walmarts and Target and Whole Foods across the country. So no one can tell you when inspiration is going to strike. But the good news is, Finding that inspiration is step two. There are things that you can do to get ready for that inspiration. So everyone you meet and everything you do and everything you learn can help put you in a better position to execute on that inspiration when it does strike. And if you can develop an entrepreneurial mindset to say yes when everyone else is saying no, you're going to have a much better chance of turning your inspiration in rea into reality. So the next time that you're eating a Girl Scout cookie, or watching Netflix, or someone offers you a lollipop, think to yourself, are my eyes and ears open for that inspiration? And when it does strike, will I be ready? Will I be comfortable taking that risk? Will I be able to say yes when everyone else is saying no? 
And will I be able to get back up after I fail for the first time, and the second time, and the third time? And if so, that inspiration may just change your life. Thank you. <laughs>